Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahedo Bible Study Podcast. This week we'll be focusing in on the first scroll of John, chapter 5, which is the culmination of our series on 1 John. In the next week and the week after that, we'll be dealing with 2 John and 3 John, which are each just one chapter in length. So we'll speedily go through those and according to God's will. And then God willing, we'll move on to the letter of Jude. Might take one or two weeks on that. Might be able to get it done in, in one week. It is only one chapter. And then we have 22 chapters of John's Revelation, the book I, I dared not to do on my last go around from 2016 to 2017. But now in 2020, I feel emboldened to at least add a few of my two cents as I read aloud and recite to you St. John's Revelation. As always, whether you find yourself on Google, on Transistor, on Apple, on Spotify, on YouTube, wherever you are, make sure you're subscribed. This helps more people to be able to find the show. Make sure that you share the ideas and or a copy of the link to wherever it is you're accessing this. And make sure that if you can, you will go to patreon.com slash Tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. We already have 14 patrons right now contributing $176 a month. And the main goal is if we can get to a few thousand, opening up an Orthodox Christian micro school in which scripture will be read aloud every day and Orthodox Christian prayer will be accompanying it. And it'll have the full-fledged kind of academic schedule that everyone's going on during this kind of corona crisis or COVID crisis. We've seen people assembling new forms of education, and we hope that if people are participating in the homeschooling movement, that they will find a way to fit scripture into the curriculum in a way that it's not in the secular curriculum. We'll begin now, 1 John chapter 5 verses 1 to 5. Today I'm in the NRSV or the New Revised Standard Version. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Belief, as we have learned constantly in the Ephesus School Network with its charter podcast, The Bible as Literature, belief can be replaced in English translations of the scriptures with the word trust. This is the utmost trust, the superlative trust that you have. And the way that you show this utmost or superlative trust is with the way that you act out your life, or in other words, the way that you live. And that is a life in obedience to the commandments of God. Our Lord Jesus sums them in the gospel very carefully and very concisely and very sweetly, I might add. Love God and love your neighbor. And then he fleshes out who your neighbor is. So this love of the neighbor or this neighbor love is not burdensome. It's not some task you must do, right? It is our great and contagious joy. I just had my cousin Iosias or Josiah on my philosophy of art and science podcast, mostly a YouTube show. And he talked about an occasion where he cooked pancakes late at night for those with munchies and drunchies on a college campus and gave it out for free. Now, why would he spend his evening weekends that way? Because in some shape, way, or form, he wanted people to be puzzled by this radical form of love that he was committing to so that he could pitch the love of Jesus Christ. If they did not inquire further, he still gave them the pancakes. But if, as they were consuming those pancakes, they had questions, uh, he used it as an opportunity to give testimony, to express the love of God in a very tangible way and associate it with their bellies, which scripture tells us elsewhere, some people make into their gods. Verses 6 to 12. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. 
and the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's very plain. Again here, um, I, will, I will mention, before I get into the plainness of the, the kind of dichotomy or binary, as I often mention, the two options, that there's a manuscript variant regarding a, an alleged later addition to establish Trinitarian doctrine. I would suggest to you that the way in which you accepted scripture was not in seeing it fall out of the heavens, but from a given faith community. So whatever it is your faith community accepts as scripture, rather than arguing with other faith communities, just accept the one of your own community and make sure you study the Bible that you have in the edition that they've given to you. Now, in Orthodox communities, we have a Holy Synod, which is a council of bishops, which is ultimately, you know, goes back to Athanasius of Alexandria and the canonization of scripture, uh, especially the New Testament scripture, right? Because the Older Testament was already canonized, or at least there was uh, quite a few uh, nodding heads and agreement around it. Anyway, submit to your Holy Synod and move on. Don't waste your time arguing about the manuscript variants, unless, of course, you're a manuscript expert. In that case, please come on my show and tell me what's going on here in verses 6 to 12. So anyway, the binary or dichotomy is that there is life or death. You are either dead or you are alive. And the sun is the criterion that lets us know whether you are dead or whether you are alive. Now, some people may be dead, but they may be walking around. Those people are zombies if they do not have the sun. That's what we're hearing here. So how did the son of God live? He laid down his life shamefully from the point of view of the world for strangers and enemies whom he defined as his neighbors. And so we must do likewise. We must manifest likewise this laying down of our own lives unto shame according to the various contexts in which we are in if we want to make sure that we are alive by having the Son of God guide every single aspect of our life. Verses 13 to 20. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the requests made of him. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a mortal sin, you will ask, and God will give life to such a one to those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not mortal. We know that those who are born of God do not sin, but the one who was born of God protects them, and the evil one does not touch them. We know that we are God's children, and that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son jesus christ he is the true god and eternal life remember how important the name is in the older testament in the hebrew bible the name hashem is the presence of god so the hashem or the presence or the face the panim of the son of god in order for us to understand it properly or to understand him properly or his name properly, we have to live in accordance. When we live in accordance with our Lord, the Son of God, we do not pray about getting Ferraris. We do not pray about getting multiple men or multiple women for fornication or adultery. We do not pray about getting fame. Instead, we ask for his revelation. We ask him to reveal the mystery of his love to us. We ask him to guide us in our life. And above all, no matter what we request and petition and ask for, 
We ask in accordance with his will. We say according to your will. Thy will be done. God willing, Lord willing. In the Roman rite or the Latin rite, there is a strain of scholasticism and hyper-rationalism. And they obsess on the Greek word here, thanatos, which is translated as mortal or death or extinction of life, according to Strong's Greek dictionary, imminent danger of death. There, there needs to be a lot more, more study. Just don't build a whole theology off this word thanatos. We see already within the Johnine literature that we've covered that murder and anger are the same. Both are bad. Both are falling short of the glory of God. And so I think the distinction as best as I can, and I'd love to be corrected here for verses 13 to 20, is what we call in our confessatory prayers or our prayers of penitence and repentance, sins that are done both wittingly and unwittingly, beknownst to us and unbeknownst. So I think this kind of mortal sin or the sin that leads to death here are the witting sins, the sins beknownst to us, not the things we're ignorant about, not the things that are gray area, the things that are so black and white to us, and still we do them. And still, if we read it in the context of the greater Johnny literature, you don't have a way out, even with the anger or with the hatred or with the murder. It's really all the same. If you self-identify as a Christian, try to align every part of your life in obedience. Get away from witting sins or sins that are beknownst to you. Verse 21. This is the last verse. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Idols, we like to think, are of the past. Idols, we like to think, are these handmade, golden, silver, wooden and clay creations of uh, that we see you know commonly in buddhism and hinduism and in other older religions maybe in the, in the american indian tradition but we have our own idols whether we're building these things now or not we have functionally the same thing anything that is of your own construction whether you are valuing arts and crafts above nature, above oceans, mountains, the plains, the prairies, space itself, we have to ask ourselves, do we focus more on the things that we make or more on the things God has made? Whether we are spending money in our community on a million dollar or multi-million dollar building or on feeding the poor and the needy, on visiting the sick and the incarcerated. These are questions we have to ask ourselves as individuals and as the groups that profess to be in the lineage of Christ and the apostles whom he hand picked. Ask yourself that question and let us give glory to God for all things.